it's designed for me for wearable art a long time ago when they sort of first started filming. And it's not something that this is a eh? Yeah, this is a shawl which is separate. And so you've got this this kind of look like Does a giant bounce purple you bumblebee. Yeah, you just kind of bounce through the room as you were. And this this gorgeous thing floats around you like a wave as you walk. It's just kind of... It's not divine. <laughs> it's theatre. Oh, this is an old Charlize Cooper dress. Feel oh, that. That's, that's two and a half kilos. Oh my goodness. Does it, you know how sometimes it's really heavy garments like this, you put them on and they actually, they're you so well structured that they, they're weightless on your body. You forget about it, yeah. Well, in Paris in 1985, maybe? Isn't it the most divine colour? It's got a skirt under it. But I mean, it's quite amazing because in 1985 it was fashionable to have giant shoulders, but these shoulders are not hugely giant. I mean, you could wear this and not feel out of place. You don't look like you're out of jealous. Well, what do you think? Too big, the shoulder pads? No, not at all. Your, your colour, you know how some people get caught in one end of the spectrum? With colours, I'll always go to, and I do that, I always stay around blue. Yes. But your, your, you go across the whole spectrum. Yes, yeah, so long as it's colour. Yeah. Because it just makes me happy. This is my first ever ball gown, which is falling apart. Silk, uh, silk organza, I think mm -hmm. that is. Tiny, tiny pin tucks. Did your mother make it? No, I bought it. I don't know how I got the money for it. 19, I think. Oh, this is my debutante dress, which my mother made. And it has tiny little handmade silk flowers, oh which she sewed one by one with little diamantes in the middle. And the little. And she had. Lush. She put a pale pink satin petticoat under it. And I said, Mum, that's a white dress. And she said, no, it's very fashionable to have pale pink, actually. So I had pale pink and silver shoes and white kid gloves. And I begged her to make the neckline lower. She said, no, thank you, Peter. You're supposed to be virgin. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I just could go on and on. What is this? Is this, this is Indian. This is um, probably about 10 years old. I've um, Indians are very over the top in the way they dress. There's no such thing as too much bling. Look at all the petticoats underneath. Oh, wow. And this is all hand done. The whole thing, the whole thing is hand done. With silver thread. With silver thread and silver um, paint, gold paint, I mean, uh, that is hand blocked. It's the most extraordinary piece. An Indian, yeah, if you, you'd wear this to an Indian wedding. An Indian wedding lasts for five days. Oh my goodness. So and you don't, you'd like you wear, wear a whole... different outfit like right. this every day. Yeah. Bitches. <laughs> so, uh, France tomorrow? No, uh, Vietnam. Vietnam. Leaving tomorrow. So 35 degrees in Saigon. So very, very light clothes. See, this is the thing. This is the sort of thing you wear in in France and in, um, see this is Indian, um, just, it just weighs nothing and the colours are light oh. and pale and you feel nice in the sunlight. And I've had these two garments for years and look at this, look at the colours on this, isn't it just amazing? Oh, how gorgeous. This is Indian yeah. and it's so light, it's just like, it's like oh, fresh oh, air. It's incredibly yeah. light. Amazing and it's to cotton. feel. Amazing to feel. It's some kind of, I reckon it's some kind of muslin. It's so fine. And this is all hand blocked. And this is all scalloped by hand. All done oh. by hand, the whole thing. Oh my God. Imagine how long it would take you to hand stitch that. Yeah, there's these workshops yeah. full of women um, who sit patiently, cross-legged, doing everything by hand. 
incredible. That's gorgeous. This is this is by the same designer, and this is a very pretty thing as as well because um, they're, they're light and they're easy to wear, and all the finishing. If you can zoom in, the finishing is utterly amazing. Tiny, tiny little dots, all put on by hand. Just oh, look at this. Yes. Just amazing. All, all this, knotted. this little lining under which you can't see, no one can see, but it's all finished by hand. And light, really light. A friend of my mother's had, um, she would hand make all her dresses, not machine oh, to really? make them, but she would hand stitch them all. Oh really, you that's know, unusual. Machine. Yeah, that's very unusual. Yeah, when they used to tailor them. Yes, and they would almost sort of sew them onto the body, wouldn't they? When you see designer clothes being made, the process is very interesting because they don't, sometimes don't cut a pattern. They will put, you'll see the designer dressing the model and he'll start pinning it and tucking it and sewing her into it. Yeah. And then the assistants have to take it out and figure out what he's done and create a pattern out of it. Yeah, and the, that move to that um, off the rack... And yes. you get something and you and you put it on and think that it should look great on you, but not everyone is no. like that. And it can make people feel really, really lousy because you try on size 12 or whatever size you are. And you and think, you, there's something wrong with my body yeah. because nothing looks good on me. Yeah. 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 Yes, but, you know, you have to take into account um, uh, cost and what people can afford but you know i still think that it's better to buy a few really good beautiful pieces that fit properly and then just accessorize mm. change it wear different things with it all the time and then you've got them for life if you want them for life if you want them for life that's another thing in which case if you're truly sick of them and you don't even believe in that whole thing then do sell them do pass them on give them to somebody who needs them you know there's lots of women's groups who who dress women mm. um, and you know pass on clothes to women who need them or who need to look good for a job interview or something that's such a good idea and then yeah. it goes around because often they often the, the people that really really need clothes um, often that charity model misses them too because if you can't afford to put food on your table you can't afford to buy an outfit mm. and so that, mm. there's this whole layer of um, of people who are clothing poor, and meanwhile, our clothing consumption is just and apparently roof. our clothing consumption is through the roof. And we do, um, we do give our clothing away. We do give a lot of clothing to charities, um, huge amounts we give away, or you know, sell to um, op shops and stuff like that. But apparently, a lot of it is wasted. A lot of it's not being used. You know, it all ends up in some other country like China or India or somewhere, and it's just in the landfill. It's not actually going on people's bodies. No, no. So this is a big problem with overbuying and and not keeping wearing these things. Well, I had a rag trader in the other day complaining that the quality of clothes he gets is so poor. People just kind of throw anything and it's not washed or anything, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that but that fast fashion, the, yeah. the quality of the textiles. Oh, you see, actual, so cool. yeah, they yeah. fall apart immediately. Yeah. And you would want to wear them anyway. Yeah. Well, I guess I did. Hear, I did read somewhere of uh, some organisation that is re reconstituting the fabric, all these clothes, um, breaking all the clothes down and making it into fabric again that can be reused um. and made into something else. I know they do that in India with um, rags and a number of different items like that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, bring like they take racks. all this fabric and I don't know what they do with it. Well, they have to cut it so they don't pay tax on it, so it gets cut ah, to start with. Yeah. Because you're not importing a, a brand new yeah. garment that can be sold, and then they um, and then they turn them into incredible, incredible rags. This is a Vietnamese dress which um, was hand. So it's very Grecian. It is Greek. It's, it's a Greek goddess ah. um, from Rome, a uh, Roman goddess from Rome. And all this is supposed to signify, you know, the Roman uh, art and, you know, the, how the Vietnamese wear their dresses 
slit. It's more a tunic more than and you wear mm -hmm. just plain black silk pants under it. But this is hand done. Now this is something you keep forever. Mm -hmm. And it's on silk. It's beautiful. So when would you wear that? I mean, you'd wear that probably to a special occasion. Dim party or... When's the last or, time you wore it? I wear it um, usually when I'm on tour actually or if I'm going to a nice concert where you have to dress up. This I'll probably wear on the last night of my tour because we have a flash dinner on the last night. I mean, I've watched music and before. dancing. I know, I've seen the videos of you singing. And ah yes, singing. no, it's a good time. It's a good time. And people go mad buying, of course. But you've got to be careful when you buy in foreign countries not to buy anything that looks too ethnic. I mean, this just gets away with it. This is not so ethnic that you'd say, oh my God, she's been shopping in Vietnam. But it's not exactly New Zealand either. Because if you get something that's too ethnic, you're never going to wear it. Mm. You're going to wear it down the street in um, Bolivia or wherever you are, thinking a great, big, beautiful skirt in Bolivia is just so fabulous and wonderful until you walk down Ponsonby Road. Yeah. And everyone says, no. That looks very, um, who was the Greek singer? Um, Nana Mascori. Nana Mascori. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she did used to wear things. Like, yeah, wow, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>